First of all, I haven't been in the drilling business 40 years. I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> but it seems like 40, but now most, a little over 30. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, my family's been around it for almost 50 now. So anyway, a cu couple things at the beginning. We'll have that double top secret code at the end, so you've got to stay for the whole thing, no matter how painful it is. But I think we'll have, we'll have some fun here. The other thing is I like a lot of, uh, or I like interaction, so if you want to stop and ask a question in the middle, uh, I don't have a script, I go off the slides, if something comes to mind, I might talk about it. I'm, actually, I'm here to learn probably more from you than you from me. So anyway, we'll go that route. The other thing is, <clears throat> on the commercial side of it, they got something in their rules and all this stuff, when you do one of these, you got to read and sign some of it. If I use a trade name or a brand name or anything like that, by no means am I endorsing that. But I, but I will use it because that's the stuff we use and that's where I relate to, okay? And if, if, you know, hopefully nobody will be offended, but I'm not promoting it. I'm just telling you, uh, you know, what we do and hopefully you can learn something and, and we'll uh, have, a, have a good session here. So today's topic's reverse circulation drilling. If you've been to the mud rotary and the air rotary drilling, they got into specific methods, some basic stuff, maybe some more complicated stuff. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that. What, what I'm gonna do <clears throat> is I'm gonna talk about reverse circulation drilling with air lift or air assist, because that's what we do in Nebraska. In, in our irrigation wells, we're primarily an ag company located in central Nebraska. We drill all over the state. We're actually licensed in six states, and we've run reverse circulation in, well, I think all those six states, probably at one time or another, but mainly, mainly Nebraska, some eastern Wyoming, Colorado, and Kansas. So, and I know folks use it in other places too, but, but anyway, uh, what I'm going to highlight is modifications to our reverse circulation drilling rig that we have right now, uh, and I'll get into that a little later. <clears throat> Just some things we did to make it easier, quicker, safer, and more adaptable to what we do. And, you know, maybe you can use it, maybe it's something you don't want to use or whatever. So uh, that's the rig right there. It's a Jet A2, uh, uh, late 70s vintage. Uh, originally built from the way I can trace it. It, uh, it uh, I think it started out in California, had a stop in Nebraska at gross irrigation in the, in the 80s. It was sold to Ramers uh, up, in, up in Michigan, up, up at uh, Mar, Michigan by Grand Rapids, and we bought it from Eric and his brothers uh, four years ago, I think. I think, you, I think Ramers had their new rig out here on the floor in 2008, if I remember right. So anyway, the other thing we're going to talk about is uh, a project we did in Wyoming that was uh, spec'd and engineered to drill straight mud rotary. We looked at it. We thought we could do better doing reverse circulation. We bid it uh, as per the engineer spec, and then we went in and got a change order and change. And I'm going to talk about what we did there, our drilling fluid program, and the development procedures we used, and then how the well performed. It was in a well field that actually had seven wells there. There were a couple that were similar in depth, so that's what we'll do to, today. Uh, again, we're in Nebraska. Center pivot irrigation is the big is is the is the king. Ag irrigation is king. Right now, we're in the middle of a dry period. Uh, some people call it a drought. It's awful dry. We're extremely busy, and uh, life is pretty good right now. Although uh, we need some moderation, we need some rain. So. We don't sell center pivots, but we provide the wells, the pumps, and uh, everything to uh, the engineering to uh, help these farmers grow, grow those crops. And as you all know, the commodities are extremely high priced, so, so things the, the, the cash is flowing in the middle part of the country, maybe not so much in some of the areas you're from if you're doing residential, but uh, right now uh, it, it's a time that I, I speak with some of the, 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 the people that live through the development times and my dad and, and I know Dick and Dick Grosh and some of those guys and they said it's, it's different. It's, it's extremely busy and it, it's a different than it was during development times. So it's pretty exciting times. Hopefully in 15 years 
or so when I retire, we can talk about these times. So hopefully we're living, living, the, living the dream or living the nightmare, whatever you want to say. But anyway, this is your basic reverse circulation rig. Some of you have probably seen this. I, I robbed this from groundwater and wells. I didn't ask for permission, but that's okay because I helped. Uh, I hope anyway. I helped. Uh, I helped them with the third edition, just reviewing some different areas in groundwater and wells. But this one here it, it looks like a schematic of a ported drill RV, probably RV6 with a pump, just a vacuum <coughs> uh, pump. I call it a gravel pump. No air assist on that. We're going to talk a little bit about air assist here in, in, in a little bit. So uh, again, reverse circulation. I don't know how many how many people drill reverse circulation. Okay, so we got a few that have to do and lots that don't. It's just reversed. I mean, the water's going down the borehole and it's coming up, coming up the drill pipe, up the inside, and, and then it's discharged out. And we'll show some close-up pictures here in a little bit. <clears throat> this rig here, this was on my grandpa's farm, uh, 1953. This well here, if I can get this cursor to work. This well here. Uh, was drilled in 1953, spring of 1953. It's, uh, it's 18 inch corrugated metal pipe, torch cut for slots. Took him six weeks to drill, 160 foot deep. And that's my dad standing right there. And I would say that probably planted the seed for our family to be in the water well business. That's him standing right there. Whoops, back up. Uh, that's him standing right there shoveling gravel in. He, he went to a country school down the road a half mile or so. He'd hurry up and come home from school so he could watch those guys over six weeks drill that thing. So that one there looks like it's got a, again, a, a dredge pump or gravel pump that they'd have to prime and with vacuum and, and, and pump and suction, suction hose in there to get it started. And, and I suppose there, there's a discharge. The hose hooked up right here, then it would discharge out to the pit. So uh, both my grandfathers were pioneers in, in the early irrigation west of, uh, northwest of Myrna, Nebraska, which is dead center in the state. Uh, that's our rig now. Again, that's the one that's late 1970s vintage, Jeffco or failing, Jet A2. Uh, you can see the trench, the, the return flow in Nebraska in most cases. I don't like this. The trench, in most cases, we do not have a surface casing. If we get some high water levels, some, some loose gravels or sand on top down by the river, sometimes we pull in our gush peck uh, bucket rig, and we'll put in surface casing ahead of the, ahead of the reverse rig getting there. So uh, you can see the, the, uh, the suction hose that goes to the centrifugal pump. There's the discharge piping. This rig's kind of a multitude of colors, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> Our colors are red and cat yellow. Uh, the rigs are cat yellow. So every component you see that's cat yellow, we've either worked on or replaced. Fortunately, we've been extremely busy ever since we bought this rig. So, uh, you know, we've replaced different components on it, rebuild them, whatever, but we haven't shut down enough to paint the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, that's not usually the way we like to do things, but we're busy, so that's okay too. Uh, again, this is flooded reverse circulation. You saw the pit there earlier with the, the return uh, trench. Uh, this is the, the drill site that day. This is about a 320 footer. They did the actual drilling in three hours. They were, uh, they were cased, gravel packed, and moved to the next site down the road probably five or six miles and back to the shop by 4.30 in the afternoon. So it's unconsolidated sands and gravels and some sandy clays, it drills fairly flat, fast, and we've got a good crew. So uh, most of the stuff we use in central Nebraska is plastic. Some of the deeper ones up out of the valleys and different things, depending on if we run Johnson, Agar screen or something, could be steel. But plastic, by and large, in east central, central Nebraska is what, what we all use, SDR 26. So. Uh, the bits we use, uh, we normally run a 28 to 30 inch hole. 
uh, in the lower, the left hand one there to your left is uh, a five cone hole opener. Uh, we run that mainly in western Nebraska in the rickery. It's not Olala with ledges and, and things and, and we put drill collars on it. The two wing drag bit just to the uh, just to the side of that is one we use in, in East Central Nebraska and some clays and stuff. It tends to cut better. It's got uh, uh, drag teeth on it to bolt on. And then the three ring one that's laying up on the drill pipe there on the trailer to the right is typically what we use in Central Nebraska. It's got a three ring Mohab uh, bit with replaceable teeth. So. Uh, then we run our flange adapter. We run seven-inch hacker drill pipe. Uh, you can see it there as a drill collar. One of our drill collars. That one there's a little bit bigger. Sixteen-inch OD steel. Uh, that one there. I do not. Yeah, that one's not filled with lead. We build our own uh, that are ten and three-quarter OD filled with lead, and we. Don't go much bigger than that because they're tough to handle. It's a safety issue with, with the tooling we got and the way we do things. So uh, we run internal air, not flange. A lot of the rigs in Nebraska are flange. Uh, this rig came with, with, with threaded drill pipe, and we felt that it was an advantage because we can cut a smaller hole in some instances, and, and I'll show you with that Sierra Madre well in Wyoming what we did a little bit later. So. One of, the, one of the things we did early on was this rig had the original engine. There were four-cylinder Detroits. Uh, we wanted more horsepower, especially for the, the, there's two power units on it. The side that runs the compressor and the uh, centrifugal mud pump, uh, when we're jetting, and we'll explain that a little bit later, requires a lot of horsepower. And it just, uh, the, the Detroits had been rebuilt once, maybe twice, and so we, we went with the Iveco engine uh, mainly because of cost. It was readily available. We bought it from our Case IH dealer. We had a plate machine. You can see that shiny part there between the transmission and the, uh, the back end of the engine. And, and they fit up real nice. And our fuel consumption, we cut in half over those old Detroits, which was nice. Plus, we got more horsepower out of them. And I, you know, we're, we're cat people. Again, there's a brand name. We're cat people. Uh, these are throwaway engines, but uh, for now, they're, they're working good, and we got, a, we got a lot better fuel efficiency. So one of, the, one of the things we went to, again, we have internal air. We had the original swivel on that rig, and uh, we spent a fair amount of money uh, trying to trying to rebuild it and, and when this rig came to Nebraska it was go, it was go hard and it's been going hard ever since well what I ended up doing was uh, buying a new swivel uh, we we got with uh, Western Paul Ebert at Western rubber uh, and uh, we took a uh, I believe that's a 6 WC I think but anyway, we, we had some special considerations we wanted. So when we bought the rig with the failing swivel and the, and the original one and the plumbing, we could not set 16-inch double random length or 42-foot long casing without pulling the Kelly and the swivel out and laying it down. And we didn't want to do that. So, uh, so I got with, with those folks at Western, and, and in fact, we designed it. We were at... Uh, we were at the legislative fly-in probably three years ago, maybe. I can't remember exactly when. And I spent the majority of the time on a laptop up in the hotel room in Washington, D.C., emailing back and forth and designing the swivel. Not that we changed the swivel that much, but we changed the, the discharge piping, the configuration of it, so when it was retracted, we could set 16-inch double random pipe. And we didn't have to pull it out. 18-inch, uh, we've done some city wells with 18-inch, won't work. The box of the dairy is not compatible. And uh, if we ever uh, build a rig or, or, or what have you, I want the box deep enough that it'll retract enough that we can set 18-inch without having some issues up there. So uh, 
with the internal air, occasionally we have some problems with uh, if we get big enough rocks or something coming up, which does happen, especially with the drag bit in the valley, that that, that steel pipe that's the internal air in the, in the Kelly might get wrapped up or something when we keep a couple spares and the guys can change it real fast uh, through the top of the swivel and I really don't have, I guess you can see it, you can see the, 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 the plumbing right there, but what we did with Western, with this particular swivel, we knew we were going to have the material passing through there, they had their internal air swivels with the, uh, the air pipe down the center, we moved it to the back. Uh, to the back, or the, I guess it would be the front side, toward the front of the rig, uh, to move it out of the way to allow better passage through there. So that swivel, you know, it was red and clean, but uh, uh, like I said, it was new three years ago, I think. Uh, the compressor is, the frame's the original compressor. It's a Leroy. Originally, I think it was... 400 CFM or something, we had to get it rebuilt. Uh, we went to 525 CFM. It does not have a high side. With internal air, we run our internal air pipe down to about 200 foot when we're running drill pipe in, and then that's where it stays at 200 feet. And it uh, works real well for circulation. So uh, the extra air meant ho more horsepower and we feel we circulate a little bit better with, with more CFM. Uh, we run a centrifugal pump. Of course, if, if any of you have been around flooded reverse circulation when you start the air. You got a question? Yes, yeah, so you run one inch air? Inch and a quarter. Yep. With inch and a half for two inch Air, I think it's inch and a half up the dairy to try to cut loss. I think it's inch and a half up the, yeah, it is. So this, this one has a 6 by 8 by 14 centrifugal mud pump. We can jet before we get down that we can use the air to lift. I think our, our drilling crew starts switching over to air somewhere between 35 and 40 feet where it doesn't go the, go the wrong way. Uh, but at times they'll use the jetter. And uh, I don't know where there it is. Uh, we can we can uh, start the centrifugal. We'll go straight for a while, maybe to 20 feet or something, and it'll switch the valving. We'll run through the jetter, the the jetty ductor right here, and then it'll create the vacuum behind and go reverse. And then occasionally, what he does is he'll slip a little air in there to help lift it before he hits 40 feet where he can go to straight air to lift. Again, that, again, the reason we went to a bigger power unit, because we're trying to run, we're not trying, we're running the compressor and the, the centrifugal all at the same time off that one power unit. And it pulls it hard, really hard. So, and then once they get down where they can go straight, air all the way and lift. Of course, they switch the valving around and then it's just air, air all the way. So we're just air lifting is what we're doing. Well, it depends how deep the air line is. You know, once we get down to 200 feet, divide 200 foot by 2.31, take off some friction loss, we're in 100 pound, 100, 115, 120 pound range, something like that. So, does that answer your question? He was wondering what air pressure we're running. Since we're running inter in internal air, what determines the air pressure is where the air, the bottom of the air pipe is and when it's lifting. Okay? So, I mean, essentially, when we're reverse circulation with air lift or air assist, we're air lifting our drill pipes. What we're doing, it's like you'd air lift a well, essentially, is what you're doing. So, so the pressure gauge there at the driller's control station, you know, takes into account friction through the plumbing and then where we're lifting. And uh, I, I'm guessing, but at 200 feet, I've been on the rig a little bit. It's in the 115, maybe 120 p psi. Does that sound right? You've been around it, Dad, more than me. So, okay. 
So we, we reconfigured the plumbing on this rig too. When we got it, when we got this rig, the driller's controls and all the consoles and everything were on the left-hand side. The discharge came out the right side. So when, you know, when you're, circu when you're drilling, circulation's key. And although you can watch the pressure gauge at the driller stand, it's nice to see that discharge piping. I'll show you in a little bit. See the water's moving and, and, dis and, and discharge and we're circulating. So we took this rig and we configured all the plumbing. And if you can tell it there, it's gray. Again, it didn't get painted yet. Uh, we, we went underneath the frame of the trailer rig and went out the other side. And uh, so we can... That's from the left-hand side. The driller's rear end's right here. You can see him underneath our spinner, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So he can see everything now. We, we replumbed the suction of the mud pump over there. Everything's over there now. So we felt that in order to drill more effectively and efficiently, we needed to have that over there. We tried that rig in the beginning uh, and didn't like it. So, you know, a little welding and some pipe in a day or two, and we had all that changed. Yeah, and that, that well there was 320 foot deep. I think he was about to the end right there. He was in some pretty good sand and gravel, and he'd let that thing load up to the point it almost quit circulating. He was drilling faster and had lifted out. And then he'd slow down a little bit, and then out had come. So uh, he, he's run this rig quite a while, our driller, drilling operations manager, and he knows how to push it pretty hard. And he, 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 He's, he does a good job, but he, he knows the equipment. Again, there's the plumbing again. You can see where it comes underneath. <clears throat> Discharges out. The guy standing there is taking samples. 99.9% .9 of the wells we drill have test holes drilled ahead of them with a straight rotary rig. And then we, we log all that. That's given to the driller, then he logs it again, and if, if he, 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 is, uh, he has the ability to make adjustments. If he wants to place the screen a little bit different than when we, than when we designed it in the, in the office. And so he, he takes samples of everything and then keeps a written log, and then he'll design it a little bit, maybe make some tweaks in it. Uh, yeah, mud rotary, straight mud rotary, right? With a, with a, we've got a couple porta drills, so we run a test hole on every every well uh, that we drill. So you're not running your centrifugal pump? No, that's air. That's air lifting from about 280 feet. So the static level is all right. You keep your pit full. Got to keep your pit full. Keep hydrostatic head. It's important to have a good water supply. That's one. Thank you for bringing that up. Good water supply is essential because when you're drilling you're using water. Not not a lot of water, but you are using water. Now static static water level at this site is probably nine or ten feet. The, the beauty of drilling in Nebraska now since development time is we've got irrigation wells everywhere. So we pipe water. We got a mile of pipe. If we have to pipe water very seldom do we haul water. Now this well this well was actually the old well that had corroded up, but we stuck a submersible in the old well, piped it over there, and I don't know, we probably had a submersible that was running three or four hundred <laughs> gallon a minute, and they only kicked it on when they needed water to keep the pit full. Yes, sir? Do you put gel in it sometimes? Yeah, we do. He, he, the question is, do we put gel in it? Yes, we do. Uh, if, if we have some uh, high gravels that we think we might have a little bit of problem with, we do mix some, but not a lot, just a little bit. Uh, Maybe uh, our, our pit volume is three times the whole volume. It might hold, you know, 25,000 gallons. Very seldom will he put more than a pallet of gel in it. We try to keep it down because some of that area that he's going through, we do put some screen in occasionally, so we don't want to plug it up. But then I'll get into a low solids uh, drill or low viscosity drilling fluid with the well we did in Wyoming in a little bit here. But yeah, once in a while we do. But again, We've got a bucket rig. If, if we go out and drill a test hole and we think we're going to have problems, then we bring in our bucket rig and set in 20 foot of surface. Just 
the little extra once in a while we charge for it. Sometimes we don't, but you know what? Once you seal that top 20 foot off, then you're, you're in pretty good shape. Doesn't happen very often it, there. And we, we had uh, one in southeastern Colorado. The formation took a lot of water, but it didn't lose circulation. With, with the stuff we're drilling in Nebraska, it doesn't happen very much, Wayne. Once in a while, you hit a crack, like in a clay, just the upper, upper part that's not saturated. Typically, you move. Exactly. That usually doesn't work very well. I'm not saying they don't do it in reverse, but it doesn't happen. You know, there's probably some people out there that might have had to do it and some really deep hole reverse stuff, but no. So if you run into that problem, it's easier just to move. Yeah. Control. And usually you know by the test hole, if you're going to have some lost circulation issues, you know when you run that straight mud rotary in there and drill that test hole, you're going to have issues. Then you deal with it then and try to, not, not all the time, but once, you know, once in a while. When you're Yep. That's nah, better. The question was if we're dealing with a deeper static water level, 200 feet, does that present problems? Not it's better. It's better. You got that hydrostatic head, and just go. Yeah, the, the upper, the higher water levels, in fact, you usually want to have a 10 foot head on that formation if you don't have surface casing, okay? And there's some areas we drill that have three foot water level static along the river could could pose a problem usually we run service casing in with our bucket rig so now nah, the deeper the better yes sir yep and I'll get into that in a little bit and out in Wyoming I mean, we didn't get real exotic out there, and I'll let you know when I go into that, but, but I will talk about stuff like that, okay? <clears throat> Any other questions? He, I, I don't know if you heard, did you hear what he said about mud properties and stuff? We're going to get into that. What size hole are you drilling? 30 inch right there. 30 inch hole, 16 inch casing, that's gravel packed. I think that well had. Uh, 76 cubic yards of gravel go in it, if I'm doing my math right. Something like that. Yep. Well, you get, you don't have that friction through there, plus if you have rocks, they don't get hung up. Yeah, there's advantages. Let's bolt together. Yeah. There's advantages. There's times I wish we had a string of it. But then, you know, we seem to deal with it okay. I mean, especially when you're running a drag bit and you get into some bigger rocks, you're not going to bust them up like you would a roller when they go up and get lodged up in there. And we tear up our, our and I'll get into our air pipe in a little bit, but we run inch and a quarter schedule 80 below the Kelly air pipe steel, and then we twist it up and, you know, you, you know it costs you about, what, 56 cents a foot. And That's on the outside of the Inside. Inside. We run internal air. What's the capacity of the well? That one there, I think we test pumped it at, uh, help me out, Christopher. That was right around 16, 1650. 1,650 gallon minute with what, 22 foot of drawdown? Yeah. I mean, it's in the Platte Valley, Nebraska. It's, it's, that's why we irrigate. I mean, we got lots of water. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll run that pivot that I showed earlier in the picture, probably set up for, that's a swinger. I think that one's set up for 1,100 gallon at, I don't know, probably 38 PSI. Probably run 50 horsepower hollow shaft motor on it probably is all. I don't think it's a 60. Is that right? Okay, all right. My sons are in the back that... They're all they all involved in the business, and so I'm asking them specific questions. Okay, all right. Any others? Move on a little bit here. Okay. This rig also, when we bought it from uh, Eric and his brothers at Ramers, they ran a uh, to put the drill pipe together to spin it together. Ran a cat head with a Manila rope. 
I don't I think I had an employee and even knew what the hell a manila rope was. <laughs> so, uh, and then Eric and his brothers on their new rig, because we've been talking to them, they put a spinner on it. So it's like, we're getting a spinner too. So we got the same spinner, I think, didn't we? I think we did. We run the same drill pipe. Yeah. So, so we didn't want anybody. It's a safety thing. We didn't want anybody getting their fingers caught. And there's probably a lot of you out there run cat heads and manila ropes and spinners. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But we didn't want to go there. So we, we bought a, a, a spinner. And it's kind of interesting. I took this picture. And again, it used to be cat yellow, but it's four years old now. I took this picture, and we're putting this slideshow together, and I, and I saw that the guard is missing. And this spinner right here, and see those chains? And this spinner uses a gear on those chains, and so uh, when we put the slide together, then my drilling supervisor was coming through the office, and his office is just right down from mine. I said, come here, look at this picture. I want that put back on. Uh, now, granted, on the next slide, the chances of somebody getting their finger in there are fairly slim, but nonetheless, the manufacturer put that guard on there, it ought to be on. So I wanted to point that out. So you can see the guy in the red hat's the driller. The controls are off to the side. He's looking back this direction to his helpers. There you can see they're spinning the drill pipe together right there. Uh, they got it tied off of that strap just off to the one side. Uh, so. so the cat head stays nice and yellow because we don't use it. Yes, sir? Isn't that spinner right enough to make up the drill pipe? Nah, we don't make it up. We've got tongs if we have to make it up. I mean, it makes it up enough that we go up. I mean... If you get into the hacker specs, you know, everybody says you're supposed to make it up, but we don't do it on our small rotary rig. So you just, the only thing they do do if they know they're going to hit some stuff, and they're running a three ring drag bit here. See that fish line, that orange fish line down there in the corner, that red fish line? Or nah, not fish line, uh, weed, eater. weed eater, weed eater string. They put, they, they cut a little bit of that, stick it on there, and then it breaks out. Because what we try to do, is we have a backup tong, we break out with the table, like you do a, like you do on a, uh, on a straight rotary table driver rig, just for speed. Now we have another tong. If we get in some deals and they're torqued up, then we have a breakout uh, on the other side. There's a cylinder and it'll break it, to break it out. Do you have each and a quarter line going down the inside? Yes. The rod? Yes. And that, that cross over at the top swivel, or? It comes out of the swivel. It comes out of the back side of the swivel on the gooseneck. How do you change your drill rod then? You have to undo it? You undo it. Until, yeah, you undo it. Yep. And thread it through the next piece? Uh, no, we got a check valve on it so it floats. You put a chain, Illinois. Yeah, yeah, you have, a, you have a check valve on it so it floats, and they got a little chain, they hook it in the, in the pipe to keep it there, okay? And then what they do, they add the next pipe before they make up the pipe, they pull the chain and let it go up. Because with the check valve, it only floats up so far. Right. It'll, it'll go up and uh, up to the, actually it'll go up and float up and hit the bale on the next piece of drill pipe. I don't know if I got a picture of that or not. With and the, the drill What? With the seven inch hacker. But what it'll do, <laughs> there's a check valve on the bottom, okay? So when you when you make it up, you, you undo the you drill down, you pull up, you undo the Kelly, okay? Then you undo the air part, and they hook a chain on it while they're bringing the next one in. They bring the next one in, it's holding up here. Then they then they undo the little chain, and then allows it to go up, and it and it top bottoms out or tops out, if you will, on top because there's a bale screwed in the top of the next piece, okay? And it hits up there. Plastic. plastic. Yeah, plastic, inch Steel quarter plastic. Steel couplers on it. You'll see a picture of it in a little bit here. Okay, all we're doing, you know, in reality, all we're doing is airlifting. We're airlifting, you know, we're airlifting uh, drilling fluid and we're to reverse it. That's all we're doing. I mean, it's no different if you go in and you develop a well. If you develop a well and airlift and you run <laughs> some four inch pipe down at an airline, down a, I don't know, eight inch casing or 12 inch or whatever, same thing. Only we're drilling and circulating 
cuttings out, okay? And you don't need to run your airline all the way down. No, 200 feet, that's it. Cut it off. We found out that that PSI and everything and with the velocity and, and the CFM, that works real good. Even if you're six or 800 feet deep? Yep. Yeah, this rig's been 700, 700 and... I don't know, 700 and change this rig's been since we've owned it. I don't know, you, you guys ever go that deep with this rig? No? Okay. Really? 760 in southwest Kansas. You're not really lifting with your air. What you're doing is aerating the column and the head differential between Exactly. That's what you're doing. The outside of the drill pipe. Exactly. The yeah. That's exactly. That's the head. Yeah. You're exact. So it's not like airlifting in the sense that But but I'm trying to picture that, okay? But yeah. It's the head differential because it's coming down. Exactly. But if you understand airlifting like I explained it, that's kind of that's what we're doing, but the head differential is what's doing it. Exactly. That's how come we can get by with 200 feet. 200 feet with, with air at uh, 120 PSI. So you get, you know. Any other questions on, on the method, the, the airlift? Now with, with flange drill pipe and bolted together, you, you insert your air at different levels. And it does the same thing, only it's, you know, injecting it on the outside of the pipe to the inside. Then you got full flow through the inside of the drill pipe. It still catch rocks in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll catch rocks. I mean, there's no way around it. What's that? Or rip the airlines off the outside. Or the bolts fall out. I mean, there's advantage. I mean, you, you know. Move your air, your air, because you run out of pressure in your compressor. What the, what they're talking about with external air, external air, you start your external air and it's on the outside. So you're, as you're drilling deeper, your air is getting deeper and deeper and deeper until you run out of air compressor capacity, pressure, and then you got to come up. Well, yeah, I mean you can, you you have air lines. It's tough to explain. I, we're getting into details here, but. Dick knows. <laughs> we don't go over 100 feet just under the air pressure. Yeah. 825. But when I want to change, I'll come out 30 feet and put another depth and go blank. Right. So you don't have to go you, you, you can do that. The other thing you can do with, with external air is you can start out with, with your air coming in at one level, and then you can, up on your swivel, you have two valves, airline valve for each airline down each side. And then when the one gets so deep that your capacity, your air compressor, is not enough, then you switch the other one, and this one's already come down and start start injecting the air at a higher level. You understand that? Okay, yes, sir. It's unrelated question. What kind of formations do you generally drill? Can you do unconsolidated sands and gravels? That's all we do. Well, that isn't all we do, but yes. That's what this works the best in. Yeah. His question is what formations... Unconsolidated sands and gravel. That's what we drill. That that's what it works the best. And although we drill harder stuff with it, and I know a lot of other people do too, in Arizona and Gary's got one going on right now. Uh, what are you drilling in right now, Gary? Well, in, in alluvial sediments right now, but we've drilled through like 500 feet of uh, old uh, granite. Yeah. Grinded, yeah. Different bit, different. Bit. Right. Yeah. Same same circulation method, but different tooling. It's slower. And a hell of a lot slower. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions dealing with circulation and the air lift and the de head deferential and how that lifts? We're going to move on to some other tooling issues that we changed. When we, when we bought this rig, it, like I said, it had the 7 inch hacker on it and it had uh, these here drill pipe slips on it. Well, we had a, we had a crew twice drop one of those, half of it, down the hole. The one time we were on a city well in Alliance, Nebraska, that was, uh, I don't know what that thing cost, probably close to $100,000. And we had a 32 inch five cone hole opener hung up at 200 and, I don't know, some odd feet. We were going to 440, 
and it wasn't so much, well, the bit cost us, I don't know, $12,000. We had drill collars on. We had all this stuff. And this thing got dropped down the hole because our, our crew was bending over, and then they dropped it on the, on the stand they, they stood on, and it was all hung up. <clears throat> the, the, blowing the bit off was one thing, but, to, but bigger than that at this site was they had an easement for this well, and they had to put this treatment plan in here, and I can't remember if it was for arsenic or something, but they had this little footprint to work within. If we would have had to move, it was going to wreck a lot of engineering drawings. And, and, and so I went up there, and uh, we hired a crane, a big crane. And, uh, and then uh, I got up there, and, and of course, you're in, you're in Alliance, Nebraska, which is western Nebraska, so the oil field out in Casper and in Wyoming, I found a wireline outfit that could blow it off, <clears throat> and uh, it, several times I thought that was the only option, and every time I got ready to call the guy, it inched up, <laughs> and, then, and then it was about 9.30 one night, and I was just ready to dial the guy in Casper and get his butt out there so we could, we could blow it off the next morning. I was giving up, and we talked to the engineering firm, and we kind of had a plan how he was going to move. And lo and behold, Eric Newbecker calls me and keeps me from dialing that guy to blow the bit off, and then it inched up again about 11 feet. <laughs> so thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. And, and then the guy running the crane, he went over his factory and he says, if my boss only knew. So we left it up there overnight, and the next morning we popped it out, and out we came. And then we fished that half out. So I'd had enough of that. Uh, How did you fish that out? Well, I was with a big magnet. I wasn't there. You were there. But, but anyway, we got it out. We completed the well. They didn't have to move their treatment plant. They didn't have to screw with the easement. So uh, a big lesson. So, you know, we think there's got to be a better way. So what we did is we built these. So it's, it's on, top of the, on top of the rotary table. It's an 18-inch uh, table. And so we got rid of the slips. We got rid of the, the, the Kelly bushing. And these doors, if you can see them there, that's the Kelly, and you got the slots right here that drive it. And if you go back, you can see the slots and those slips. So, so now these things will drive it. And better than that, see these hinges? They ain't going anywhere. They're not going to go down the hole. And then when we make the change, they flip it open. It's easier. You don't have to lean over, brick, you know, over that table, the helpers, and... Yes, sir. Once in a while, that's why the holes are there. Doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the same thing. You've got doors. Okay. So the tire. Oh, that's the rotary table. <laughs> Might be. I don't know. Whoops. Anyway, so we put doors on it. So the doors function as the drive bushing for the Kelly. It also functions as a slip to catch the drill pipe. And then if you need to pull them out, there's pins to pull them out uh, off the table. That table comes apart or no? No, we flip it up to set casing. Yeah, we, wanted it, we wanted to raise the draw works and make it sliding, but we haven't got that far yet. But it, it's, a, it's on a hinged affair with a double knuckle U joint you can barely see in the front there and you just flip it up with the with the one of the lines right so there no problem kept the hole full never lost an inch nothing yeah keep the hole full there was not one there was not one ounce of fill on top of that slip in the hole we went down and got it with a magnet believe it or not lucky very lucky not necessarily. Yeah. Nope, keep the hole full. All you got to do is keep that hole full. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Now, keep what? Keep your pit. Yeah, you dig a pit big enough. We're going to get into that in a little bit. I'm going to keep moving here. Most of our pits are earth pits too, by the way. Okay, the air pipe, we talked about a little bit. Uh, 
what we got here is we used to drag this stuff up off the, the drill pipe support trailer and hoist it up. We said, well, there's got to be a better way. We got a little rack up, snuck up inside the derrick, and you can see the you can see the inch and quarter schedule 80 stuck up in there. So all they got to do is reach up there, bring it in, run it in. Of course, if it gets all tore up, they got to bring some more off the trailer. But another another little safety, make a quicker deal. And then you can see in the bottom of the Kelly right there, the 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 steel one that's, that stays with the Kelly just hanging out right there. That's the bottom of it. We used to go with a quick coupler. We had some issues with a quick coupler. We just make them thread it onto a steel coupling. We'd get a lot better luck there. So. And then you can see the air pipe. This right here, I took this picture that day. They were almost down to total depth and all the air. They keep 200 foot in there, 180 or whatever, and it was all out. So just another little thing we did, stuck it up inside the derrick there, and make things easier and more safer, hopefully. Another thing we did with that heavy hose, I don't know if you saw the picture earlier, we run a, from the swivel gooseneck up, we run a hose all the way down to the discharge piping and it bolts on the back, right? You can see it hanging right here. Well, when you, when you got that in the up position, that heavy hose hanging, when the Kelly comes out on the slide, it, it's all kind of twisted a little bit and it's not out. We had guys reaching over, <laughs> hands in the way and stuff. So what we did, this this year, this fall, we put a push arm cylinder up the derrick, and what it does when he lowers it down and it comes out of the retract position and starts out, then that he hits the lever and pushes that out, pushes that cylinder out, makes that uh, Kelly straight, and all they do is hook up the airline, it comes right down, they spin her together, keep the hands out of the way. Because usually it comes out, it's twisty. Have you ever been around a reverse rig, that big old hose up there? We don't run a stamp pipe. Some of the, some of the reverse rigs, uh, I was talking to Gary Hicks earlier today, so the reverse rig that he's got, that, that he's consulting on has a standpipe like a straight mud rotary rig. Ours does not. We run a hose all the way so we can keep the rocks moving through. One less place for wear, we believe. So it, so it creates a little, little problem with that thing when, when we're setting it back over the drill pipe. And so we, we, we come up with this push arm thing to get it all centered and down it comes, keep, keep the hands out of the way. Okay, and then one other thing we added, and, and, and something that was very simple we didn't do, we have this 45-foot trailer, the drill pipe on the back 20 foot, and other things on the front, and bits and all this stuff. We added catwalks that fold down, so when we're laying pipe out with a tail outline, they got a catwalk that comes down the side and, and hooks directly to the... Uh, hooks directly to the, the back of the rig. And maybe a lot of you got that. We didn't do it. We had a guy hopping up from the stand there where I got the pointer. They'd hop up on the back and then run down that drill pipe when it come out of the hole and it was wet, maybe a little slimy from drilling fluid or just the natural clays. Very, very unsafe. So now it doesn't show it except right here in the corner is that's the bang board for the drill pipe. Well, they come down and it comes down into that area, a four or five foot area in front of there. So it's a path all the way through. They just walk down it, and they move the tail out line and the rabbit back and forth so they can lay the pipe out. Another safety issue, uh, you know, so we don't have people falling off trailers or tripping on wet, wet drill pipe. So another thing we added. Pretty simple stuff. We got a good fabrication shop that uh, just give them an idea and they run with it. So. Plus, our, our people come up with that, too. The, the drill operators and helpers come up with ideas. So, <clears throat> All right, anything else before I go into this specific well issue or well project we had? Slower, bigger hole. I, I can't even answer the RPM. I mean, he's got 20. five gears, yeah, 20 RPM. It just depends. You know, he's got five gears and, and uh, yeah, because you're just cutting a big hole. The other thing that you do with this seven-inch hacker is we can out-drill what we can lift in, in unconsolidated sands and gravels with that internal air. What we'd like to do someday is go to eight-inch drill pipe. Of course, everything's bigger, more expensive, 
so we can have more flow with a bigger swivel, <laughs> bigger hose, bigger everything. You still can too. You still out drill. Yeah, what, you can out drill it. Do do you full open? Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Dick. Yeah. With more CFM. Yeah. Well, we're running five about five fifty, but I, I always figure with that internal air and the seven inch, we we got some restriction there too, some friction. Is that right? But eight inch though. Internal air, yeah, but eight inch. I think the kicker's eight inch. I mean, I agree with you, but I think the kicker is, is the eight inch. Probably more. Yeah, yeah, right. But we can out drill what we can lift. But he watches the discharge. It slows down a little bit. He he slows it down, catches up, and away he goes again. Any other questions? All right, we're going to go into a specific project. And we're probably going to run right to 5 o'clock maybe, but uh, anyway. This is kind of a neat project. <clears throat> we, we had the opportunity to bid. It's in Wyoming, west of Laramie, south of Saratoga. And I don't know if, if you know that area. If you could drive straight west of Laramie, you'd about run into this, but you can't. you got to go around uh, west on I-80 to, what's the exit, Dad? Uh, I can't remember. West there, but Right, but but anyway, south of Saratoga, Wyoming, and it's the in the Sierra Madre. It's a Sierra Madre Joint Water and Sewer Board serves Riverside, Wyoming, encamp, encampment, yeah. encampment, another little town up there. They had a well field here. This is well number seven. Now they didn't have seven production wells there. That included everything they drilled there, but they had they had one production well that was the depth we were going, and they had another one that was 440, and then some of this other stuff here. And I know this doesn't, you can't see it very well, but what what happened or how this thing come about? They need to add another well. They designed it just like number six. Number six was a uh, seven inch steel casing. You probably can't see it there very well. Uh, they, they designed number seven just like number six, seven inch steel casing uh, to about 170 feet. Uh, then they wanted to drill a, a six and an eighth inch hole. I think that's what that says. Six and an eighth inch hole, the total depth, which they thought at the time was 620, 622 or thereabouts, and do it the same way and hang, it, hang Johnson's screen in there with a liner, just hang it in there. Well, their, their wells, this well, uh, they had a history of it. It, it did okay, but, it, but when you read the history, and I don't have it in here, but it just, it, it just we, we looked at it, and we, we knew there was a better way. Okay, So we went ahead and bid it as per the engineer spec, and then we asked for a change order uh, to do it, reverse circulation, 14 and three quarter inch borehole all the way, with the exception of the surface casing in the top uh, 35 feet, and then and then uh, use eight and five eighths or eight inch casing and, and Johnson stainless steel screen and uh, gravel pack it, and then of course grout the top end. So we were fortunate, and what we did with the change, what we had to do with the change order is we had to. We had to show them that we could drill this thing, first of all, reverse circulation. And then the other thing is we had to show them a drilling fluid program that we could use. Now, they were used to, you know, mud and all kinds of things, drilling straight rotary. and took several days to do it and all kinds of issues that they had. And, of course, all kinds of development things. So what we did, what's that? What, what kind of gallonage were they, yield were they after? About 150. 150. And then I'll tell you what we got. <laughs> you probably know where I'm going with this, okay? So we got, again, this is not an advertisement, but we, we work with uh, uh, Halliburton Bayroid IDP, the guy that helped me with the drilling fluid program, standing right back there with the gray hair in the corner, who happens to be my uncle, but that's okay. And so we come up with a drilling fluid pro program that was low, low viscosity uh, bentonite polymer system. And, and it was very simple. 
but the first thing we got to do is we got to we're digging this earth pit. We're going 14 and three quarter inch hole, 620 foot deep, which in reality I think it ended up being 630 something. So we want a pit volume three times the size of the borehole volume, three times the borehole volume. So we calculate everything. We put all this on a piece of paper. Uh, we had our target properties, pH of 9 to 9.5, which we got water on site because they had wells there already in a system already, so we had a fire hydrant right there. So we had water readily available. We want to run a viscosity of somewhere between 32 and 33 seconds. And then we're going to keep our weight down about 8.6 to 8.8. .8. And I'll get into the geology in a little bit. So then we, we planned all this out, submitted to the engineer, we, we showed him we could do it at no extra cost, and we got to go ahead with the change order. And then those other calculations were just to show them what we plan to use and, and the amount of quantities. And you can see down there, under number two maybe, maybe you can't see it, to, to initially start, uh, now be mindful, we got 35 foot, 35 foot of surface casing in there already. I think it was 18 inch, I think, or maybe 20. We'll show it on another graph here in a little bit. So we just started, all we started with was uh, uh, 15 to 20 pounds of quick gel per gallon. All we mixed was 54 to 72 sacks. We, missed, we mixed less than two pallets of mud to get started in a pit that held somewhere between 16,500 and 18,000 gallons. Then we had a quick troll LV, polymer, low viscosity, and that, that wasn't a whole lot, 180 pounds to start with. And then Easy Mud Goal, another polymer, control some fluid loss and stuff in there with the quick troll. And, and then we took off, uh, or that was our plan, I'm sorry. And then what, what we did, uh, what we did here was, uh, again, I mean, this thing, this, this well field had a well at, at the target depth. So, I mean, we knew what we were going to run into. So, so that was an advantage. The other, the other thing was uh, we had good water available. And the other thing was we knew the degree of difficulty based on when they drilled it with mud rotary from when they drilled the other one in, I don't know, it was in the 90s sometime. So, we, so uh, the, the proposed design was based on well number six that we bid on. And actually, when we drilled it, you'll see in a little bit, once we drilled it and then we e-logged it, we changed the design a little bit. And then we got the other things. We had to, we had to grout it, so we had whole plug chips or bentonite chips. And then we had to cement it. And we had uh, 16 by 30 Colorado silica sand we are running. Uh, I believe we ran 30 slot stainless steel screen, Johnson, and all that stuff. And, and, then, and then you can see right down, I don't know if you can see it very good, Wayne, but this was part of the deal right here. Desired production, 150, 200 gallon a minute. And that was based on what that other well did. And then I got the other contact numbers. But anyway, that's, that was our change order. We sent the engineer. We got a stamp of approval on the way we went. This, this you can't see very well at all, and you can get these, if, if you're a member of the association, you can go online and get this talk uh, uh, and, and download it. So this is just the geology of, of the, 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 uh, the hydrogeologist was out of Laramie, and, and he you know, took samples at the discharge. Again, uh, total depth. Uh, we had gravel and sand at 612. That second to the last line, you can't see it very well. I thought it would look better than that. The sand and gravel with some quartz and lith lithics, it looks like. Then we went into some clays down to 330. And that was total depth when we drilled the well. 14 and 3 quarter inch borehole with just a mill tooth bit uh, with, I can't remember if they run two or four drill collars. <laughs> This is the e-log. Again, you can't see it very well, but the one thing that happened with the e-log is in well number six, they put screen up around 170, and there was nothing there. So what they did here is, is they rearranged the screen design from the original engineer's proposed design when we bid it, and the top screen's down here at, uh, 
whoops. The top screen's down here like 235, not 170, 175 in well number six, okay? And also in well number six, they couldn't go any lower than 170 because they had a liner hanger and it was five inch or six inch pipe and the submersible had to hang above it in that production well. So that, and we'll get into a little more of that in a little bit here. But you can see a pretty good kick right here in the bottom. And that was that gravel down there at uh, between six, 600 feet and 612. Boy, that pointer doesn't stay on very long. Right in here, some pretty good kicks down here. Okay, here's the actual design. Again, 14 and 3 quarter inch borehole to total depth of 630. First screen is right here, and it is 235 to 250. And then there's a little blip right here at uh, 292 to 292 to 300. And then on down through here. But but the e-log told the engineer we had we had 100 foot of screen, five and 10 foot lengths, and we were able to make all this up on site. Yes, sir. Yeah, we used our bucket rig. We drilled, uh, we drilled uh, 35 foot of surface, 26 inch hole, 18 inch OD casing, cemented in before we pulled over the hole. And then how long did it take to drill? That's uh, on the next slide, 14 and a half hours. 630 foot deep, 14 three quarter inch hole. And that's what this goes down through. <clears throat> this goes, and I, I hope you can read it, but I'll just, I'll just kind of read along. Uh, we're, we were the drilling contractor. The engineering firm was out of Saratoga, Saratoga, Wyoming, PMPC engineers. Hinkley Consulting out of Laramie was a hydrogeologist that we had to convince to do the change order with. He'd never done this before. And I believe he was a consultant on all the other wells out there. I, I, I don't recall. But December 10th, we mobilized. Uh, that was two years ago, mobilized and, and set the surface casing. I, I think then the guys come home for the weekend. We got out back out there December 14th, started drilling. We were down in 14 and a half hours. And uh, actually, when we were doing our, all our mud checks and our mud properties, we were running 30 second mud, and we used 70 sacks of quick gel, six bags of soda ash, 70 pounds of quick troll gold, 80 pounds of easy mud gold, and a half a gallon of easy mud, which is a polymer. And then we, we add it over the course of the drilling. And when we add it, when we add it, we add it at the flow line or down the surface pipe, of course, because the flow is going backwards, remember. Why'd you bother with gel? Yeah. Well, it's low viscosity because of the unconsolidated and because we want to cut water loss. And we need, rather than fresh water, we felt we need to control water loss. Well, I know, but you could have done the same thing with the, enough, the polymer that you have there. Uh, maybe, but our consultant back there in the drilling fluid. It, it, this program has not only worked here, it's worked in other places, so it's kind of like when you're, you go to war with this, a horse and he does you good in battle, you stick with him. But now we tweaked it a little bit, Wayne, but yeah. You had a geologist you had to convince. Yeah, and so we, you know, we run Halliburton IDP and had, or Bayroid IDP, and it, you know, it worked. So, I mean, 14 and a half hours, pretty fast, cutting a hole that big. <clears throat> And then he estimated our circulation at approximately 350 gallon a minute through that seven inch stem. That sounds about right. I've never really measured it, what we circulate, but that sounds about right. And, and then we had three, three drill collars. Again, that's 10 and three quarter. One concern we had sometimes when we run drill collars, running 10 and three quarter inch pipe, running a 12 or 14 and three quarter inch hole is that velocity by that drill collar. And if we're unconsolidated and how unstable or stable that formation is and what that velocity is. And I did some calculations. I talked to our Bayroid IDP guy. We visited about it. We thought we were safe and ended up we were because when we, when we put our sand in there, our filter pack, our 1020, it was almost to the pound of what we calculated. So we didn't have any blowouts. And I think they run a caliper log too. I know they did. Yeah, they run a caliper log too. Tremmy, Tremmy, yep. So then uh, going into December 15th, I think we ran around the clock, and then we set casing. 
Uh, completed it like I'd shown on there, uh, 1020 Colorado Silica that we got out of the Colorado Springs area. And then that come up to 141 and put chlorine as we were trimming in, we mix chlorine and we, we circulate fresh water as we're, as we're trimming that gravel in and super sacks. <clears throat> and then by the time uh, that got all done, we're, we're into December 16th. Uh, we put five foot of bentonite chips in and got our cement come out of Rollins, Wyoming, put neat cement, pumped it in. And then I believe we set a submersible stump, started pumping it. Tore the rig down there home by Thursday. And we're probably 350 miles from there, I think. Something like that. Was it more than that? Yeah. So then, then uh, uh, we went back out. Uh, set a pump in at 210. We pumped it two hours at approximately 350 gallon a minute. Got the rest of the drilling fluid out. Our specific capacity at that point in time was 2.5 gallons per foot. And then it was Christmas time. So we, we did some initial development, but there was more to do. And, and truthfully, when they called and told us that we were going to drill this thing before Christmas in December in Wyoming, not as bad as December in Alaska, but but things worked real well, obviously, as you can tell by the timeline here. So then, then we go back out and we start, we run a three or four inch pipe to the bottom with a surge block disc in there. And then we started airlifting each section of screen. And that's what January 5th talks about. It talks about there, and if you can't see it, I'll just read it. Tripped in to 600 foot to airlift remaining drilling fluid from the screen and casing, remove fluids of 610, unable to proceed into casing due to must have had some sounder cable down the hole. Something happened. Tripped out development tool and then went back in with our 10 foot isolation tool. And with that 10 foot isolation tool, I wish I had a picture of it, just a, a double disc and then it had the, the air line running down where it could airlift that 10 foot area. So we can move e into each 10-foot section of screen and airlift it. <clears throat> and then, uh, well, it describes that their airlift screens, 10-foot intervals, use an isolation tool, gasket on ends, a 10-foot piece, a 4-inch pipe, into which air is injected at 100 to 300 foot. Now, static water level in this well is like 42 feet or something, 39 feet or something like that. I'll get into that later. Until discharge is clear. Included surging cycles, work, working bottom to top. The airlift was approximately 50 gallon per minute from all sections. No, we couldn't get any drawdown measurements on that deal. Uh, this is backtracking a little bit. Talked about penetration rates. Well, the penetration rates from before, we drilled it in 14 and a half hours. So the penetration rates were all the way from, you know, we, we'd do 20 foot in nine minutes to yeah, nine minutes to eight. Eight minutes was the quickest 20 foot. As we got to the bottom, I think the bottom, the bottom was uh, about 21 minutes. So it, it, it drilled pretty fast. We were walking the dog, needless to say. So yeah. Yeah. The annulus seal between the screens? No. And, and no. I guess my question is, do all those different uh, formations have the same 42 foot static water level or is there some vertical flow? I, I have no idea. And, and maybe, well, the, the, the other wells there could, could tell us that. I could go back. I think there's some static water levels. I, I don't know. You know, I, the, the, the point being is the other wells there, the two other deeper wells are the same construction with that liner in there. You know, they went down about 170 and run that liner and hung that screen in there. To One was 440, the other one was 611 or 620. So. All right, Th this is the final report uh, that the engineer did. Of course, this is all funded by public money, but uh, anyway, I'm just going to read through this, and this pretty well sums it up. Uh, the first part says, in part, 
due to the reverse circulation techniques used to construct well number seven, well development proceeded easily. The initial airlift of each screen section was initially turbid but cleared up very quickly. Pump test discharge was entirely clear. At the end of the pump test, and I can't remember exactly how long the pump test was, but all I know is our contract ended up being about $4,000 less because it developed so easy and we were paid by the hour. So I mean, we got paid less. So uh, at the end of the pump test, a five gallon bucket of water was collected with only two grains. He called submillimeter of sediment. Uh, the next paragraph, well number seven has the highest production capacity of the three wells. There must be three wells that are actually produced. The other four must have been, I think, some, a shallow one that didn't work so well, and then some, maybe some observation wells or something, or maybe production wells that got turned into observation wells. But anyway, this is the third, third production well at this site that they're actually using. Uh, Well number seven has the highest production capacity of all three wells by virtue of accommodating a pump setting lower than any of the others. Well, the reason we could go lower is because we got full diameter all the way to the bottom, for one thing. The other thing was, is by virtue of the e-log, we designed the well on the fly, kind of. I mean, the e-log showed that there was no reason to put screen at 170. Most engineers like to run the pump above the highest screen. So we didn't have a screen start till 235, 240. So we were able to adjust on the fly out there. <clears throat> uh, the high, yeah, well here it says that the highest screen section in well number seven is also deeper than the highest screen section in any of the wells. It is generally desirable to keep the pumping level above the screened intervals. The maximum one day capacity of well number seven, keeping the pumping water level above the screen is approximately 380 gallon a minute. So this engineer more than doubled what the other two wells are doing, just, just right out of chute. Uh, plus it developed easier and all those things. Now the, the third paragraph goes on to talk about if they wanted to, to even pump more water. Well number seven was constructed with full diameter, eight inches of total depth. This allows setting a pump below the top screen section, which sometimes they do. Although undesirable for sustained production, drawing the pumping water level down to a point lower than the uppermost screens would allow additional production to meet short-term demand. So they could put the pump lower if they wanted to. And we set the pump here, and I, I think we're at uh, in that 200-foot range, I think, is, is where we set it. The pumping water level number four is routinely, low, retu, retunely lower than the uppermost screen. So number four is a little bit shallower than number six, but it's always lower than the uppermost screens. Production rates in excess of 500 gallon minute could be provided with a sufficiently deep pump setting on well number seven. So, you know, this is one of the success stories, but, but we had a lot of things to go by. We had a developed well site. We had some things that we could see that other folks did that maybe we could do better and then ultimately we we got the change or drill reverse circulation and then we had a good mud program and things worked so good that we got paid about four thousand dollars less but, that, <laughs> but that's okay because they got a lot of water and i know that engineer will drill reverse circulation again in in the geology that'll allow it so uh any, any questions on the Sierra Madre number seven? I went through it fairly fast. We're closing in on five o'clock. Uh, once in a while, it feels good to have one get under your belt that uh, everything went perf mostly perfect. We had a truck in a snowstorm run off the road on I-80 west of Laramie. Didn't damage anything, but that was probably the worst thing that happened. So, you, little truck. Tom, even though you got paid $4,000 less, was it a profit? Yes. Yeah. When you can drill a hole that size in 14 and a half hours, yeah, I think we did okay. How about your water log? And you're using the Fit9 products on this particular job where you usually don't use the back of the graph. Is that just a position routine? I know you have some other engineers on site and things like that, but was it really necessary? So you're at, what you're asking is could have we used fresh water? Yeah. I wouldn't have felt comfortable with it. I, I want to control some water loss. I do want to control a little bit of water loss, 
and I'm, you know, I'm not a mud engineer by any means. That's why we ask the people to help us out and we come up with this stuff. But I, we're a lot better off. I think we, we circulate the, the material out better. We allow it to settle out. I just... On this job, yes. But you got to remember, this is a, I don't know what, I can't remember what this contract was for. A couple hundred thousand, 250,000, I don't know. I, I want to use everything I can use to make sure I'm successful. Okay. Now, in Nebraska, in the unconsolidated, a little different deal. I mean, we're, we're blowing those things in in five hours. So, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, we drilled one in southeastern Colorado down by New Mexico this summer. And we had tremendous water loss in the bottom in the Santa Rosa formation, I think. I mean, it was, I mean, we were, we had water loss that, that, that was probably in the 300 gallon per minute at times. And we controlled it for a while, but fortunately the bulk of it was in the bottom. And when they set casing, they had no water at the surface. But it was successful. And I think it was a lot more a lot more successful because we had a good drilling fluid program in the upper end. I mean, I wouldn't want to have done it without it. Now, am I, am I a guru or am I an expert on reverse circulation drilling program? No, I'm not. I just know where to go for help. And, and, and you know, and, and we, you just learn that over time just like a lot of you learn stuff. But, but a little bit does help. You know, we had we had a case where in northeast Nebraska last last uh, summer, where we had some some sands coming in on us at 300 and some feet. Well, we we I I called Gene. I said we got a problem. We talk over the phone. He said, Well, we need to get that Biscay. We we're drilling fresh water, and we kept it thin because it got real heavy, and we thinned it. We drilled through so much clay, reverse circulation. We had sticky problems and all kinds of things. But on the whole, long time, we got down the sand. We thinned it too much. We had almost fresh water, and we had this sand sloughing on us. I mean, we had a pile out there that probably looked like Maui Beach out there in the pit, and we had some issues. Called Gene up, and I said, we got to do something. And so he says, okay, mix some gel. We thought in talking over the phone that we were going to have to have a viscosity up to about 35, 36. Well, we got it up to 31, and then things started going the other way for us when we got the well completed. Just, you know, from 20, 27 second to 31, 30, 31 made all the difference in the world. It, start, it quit sloughing off. Boy, it take a lot of gravel pack. Where is this? Where is this? Are you in the back of well, it was it was in northeast Nebraska, tough area. I don't want to go back. So I like my chances better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>